Section 6 of The Ring and the Book, An Interpretation, by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6. Count Guido Franceschini. We have heard the story of The Ring and the Book, as related first by the poet, who has put the life of his spirit into it, then by voices of the Rome of 1698, speaking on one side or the other on the street, or on either side in the drawing-rooms. These speak, however, as representative characters. But now we hear the narrative of one who has a vital personal interest in the matter, and is an integral element in the story. Count Guido Franceschini knows that every word he says may count for life or death. Guido appears to plead his cause before the judges of the Roman court. He has been severely racked, but he is determined to assume the most gracious mood. He thanks the court for giving him wine when he had expected only vinegar. He disclaims all bitterness of feeling for the sufferings he had been compelled to undergo. They were only what the law demanded. And, after all, all these physical sufferings were as nothing compared with the rasp tooth toying with his brain during the last four years the poverty of his home the exposure of its economies the scandalous reports about his treatment of his wife and her actual misconduct these things had caused him more anguish than the court could inflict its mistake had been simply to make a stone roll down hill to make him ope his mouth in his own defence he acknowledges that he killed Pompilia and the Comparini, and he proposes to give the right interpretation of the irregular deed. His defence falls into three main divisions. The first division, with the exception of the introduction just described, is entirely devoted to an account of his life experience up to the time of his marriage to Pompilia. He relates this to show that his present condition is due to the fact that he had been willing to walk in the path prescribed for him. He relates the history of his family, recalls its former wealth and power, and notes the poverty into which it had fallen. We became poor as Francis or our Lord. He says he was led by this state of his family to consider why such an one, whose grandfather sold tripe, was adding a fourth tower to his purchased pile, while his own palace could hardly show a turret sound. Why another, whose father dressed vines, should roll in wealth and luxury. He observed that the first was a soldier, the second a priest. He thought he might do as they had done, if he should enter either the army or the church. To this, however, his relatives would not listen. It would not do for him, the oldest son, to risk his life in battle, or to doom his family to extinction by taking the vow of celibacy. That might do for his brothers, but not for him. So Guido went to Rome, took minor orders, which brought him near the church, and yet left him free from some of his obligations, and entered the service of a cardinal. In that service he waited for thirty years. At the end of that time he became discouraged and said to his friends, I am tired. Arezzo's air is good to breathe. Vittiano, one limes flocks of thrushes there. A leathern coat costs little, and lasts long. Let me bid hope good-bye, content at home. His friends protested against his withdrawal. Like gamblers, they did not like to have one of their number leave too much discouraged at his losses. But his brother, the Abate Paolo, said to him, Count, you are counted. Still you've coat to back. Not cloth of gold and tissue, as we hoped, but cloth with sparks and spangles on its frieze, from camp, court, church, enough to make a shine. Entitle you to carry home a wife. With a proper dowry, let the worst betide. Why, it was just a wife you meant to take. Paolo found out that Pietro and Violante had a daughter, and a small fortune. He told Guido, 
she's young pretty and rich your noble classic choice is it to be a match guido accepted all and was married to pompilia he says that when his trouble came he was asked what no blush at the avowal you dared buy a girl of age beseems your granddaughter like ox or ass a flesh and blood a ware a heart and soul a chattel in reply to this he boldly avows that his marriage was purely a business transaction so much money for so much nobility honour is a privilege worth the market price to be sold to the one who will pay most for it true he says pietro and violante soon grew tired of the bargain just as others may of a picture they have purchased they found his way of living very different from what they had imagined it and could not endure it but guido claims i paid down all engaged for to a doit delivered them just that which their life long they hungered in the hearts of them to gain in corporation with nobility thus in word and deed for that they gave me wealth pietro and violante had the name they bargained for and the lot was none other than the daily hap of purblind greed that dog-like still drops bone grasps shadow and then howls the case is hard guido discusses the obligations of marriage and seeks to justify his treatment of pompilia and his conduct in general he declares that pompilia broke her pact and that he had a right to be harsh he denies that marriage called for love on his part if someone's daughter had avowed her love for him and appealed to his love for her then indeed the lady had not reached a man of ice i would have rummaged ransacked at the word those old odd corners of an empty heart for remnants of dim love the long disused and dusty crumblings of romance but here we talk of just a marriage if you please the everyday conditions and no more guido had married pompilia as one would purchase a hawk and if the hawk does not render the expected service he has a right to twist her neck he says the obligation i incurred was just to practice mastery prove my mastership pompilia's duty was submit herself afford me pleasure perhaps cure my bile he maintains that pompilia had no more right to complain of his treatment than the monk who found the claustral regimen too sharp because he had fancied francis manner meant roast quails guido then says the couple father and mother of my wife returned to rome published before my lords put into print made circulate far and wide that they had cheated me who cheated them pompilia i supposed their daughter drew breath first mid rome's worst rankness through the deed of a drab and a rogue was by blow bastard babe of a nameless strumpet passed off palmed on me as the daughter with the dowry daughter dirt of the kennel dowry dust of the street naught more not less naught else but oh ah assuredly a franceschini and my very wife he then states what pompilia ought out of sheer gratitude because he had not turned her out of doors to have said after her reputed parents had fled why here's the word for word so much no more a vow she made her pure spontaneous speech to my brother the abate at first blush ere the good impulse had begun to fade so did she make confession for the pair so pour forth praises in her own behalf in answer to the accusation that this was the language of a letter which he himself had written and caused her to trace he allows its truth and urges that he only 
made her see what it behoved her see and say and do feel in her heart and with her tongue declare he seeks to justify this by comparing it with the act of the priest who causes the palsy smitten finger to make the sign of the cross at the critical time or who baptizes the inarticulate babe who may grow up and disown what is done but guido continues pompilia soon discovered she was young and fair and instead of acting as in view of the reports of her birth she should have acted she displayed her charms and found the lover in the priest caponsacchi it was in the house from the window at the church from the hassock where the theatre lent its lodge or staging for the public show left space that still pompilia needs must find herself launching her looks forth letting looks reply as arrows to a challenge on all sides ever new contribution to her lap till one day what is it knocks at my clenched teeth but the cup full cursed collected all for me and i must needs drink drink this gallant's praise that minion's prayer the other fop's reproach and come at the dregs to caponsacchi it is true he was harsh but it would have been better for all if he had been even more severe and he says if i instead of threatening talking big showing hair powder a prodigious pinch for poison in a bottle making believe at desperate doings with a bauble sword and other bugaboo and baby work had with the vulgarest household implement calmly and quietly cut off clean through bone but one joint of one finger of my wife why there had followed a quick sharp scream some pain much calling for plaster damage to the dress a somewhat sulky countenance next a day perhaps reproaches but reflections too so by this time my true and obedient wife might have been telling beads with a gloved hand awkward a little at pricking hearts and darts on sampler possibly but well otherwise not where rome shudders now to see her lie the result of the course which he did adopt was that he awoke one morning to find that pompilia had eloped with caponsacchi he pursued and overtook them everyone blamed him he says for not taking his revenge at the time he found them then was the time or never to take the natural vengeance but now when he has killed his wife and her parents everyone cries so little reverence for law the only reason why he failed to act at the critical moment at the inn must be all think because he was a coward but he says he had been taught all his life to respect law and for that reason he had appealed to it even if he were a poltroon still he had his rights so he had pompilia and caponsacchi arrested and found in the room where they had been letters which he declares it would be useless for them to say they did not write he then relates the course which law took in the matter it had inflicted only mild punishment upon pompilia and caponsacchi but mild as the punishment was it proved them guilty and himself innocent on this ground he had applied to the court for a divorce he's banished and the facts the thing why should law banish innocence an inch here's guilt then what else do i care to know the adulteress lies imprisoned whether in a well with bricks above and a snake for company or tied by a garter to a bedpost much i mind what's little least's enough and to spare the little fillip on the coward's cheek serves as though crabtree cudgel broke his pate but the court refused his request for a divorce informed him that he was met by the cross suit of his wife for a separation and also that she had been transferred to the care of her parents 
His brother Paolo, who had tried, in vain, to induce the Pope to hear the case himself, was overwhelmed with the ridicule of Rome, and left Rome for some other land. After all this, Guido says, he endeavoured to steel his heart against whatever might happen, when there came the unexpected tidings of the birth of a son. I got such missives in the public place, when I sought home, with such news, mounted stair, and sat at last in the sombre gallery. T'was autumn, the old mother in bed betimes, having to bear that cold, the finer frame of her daughter-in-law had found intolerable. The brother, walking misery away o'er the mountainside with dog and gun belike. As I supped, ate the coarse bread, drank the wine, weak once, now acrid with a toad's head squeeze, my wife's bestowment. I broke silence thus. Let me, a man, manfully meet the fact, confront the worst of the truth, end, and have peace. I am irremediably beaten here, the gross, illiterate, vulgar couple. Bah! Why, they have measured forces, mastered mine, made me their spoil and prey from first to last. They have got my name. Tis nailed now fast to theirs. The child, or changeling, is anyway my wife. Point by point, as they plan, they execute. They gain all, and I lose all, even to the lure that led to loss. They have the wealth again they hazarded a while to hook me with, have caught the fish, and find the bait entire. They even have their child, or changeling, back, to trade with, turn to account a second time. They have caught me in the cavern where I fell, covered my loudest cry for human aid, with this enormous paving stone of shame. Well, are we demigods, or merely clay? Is success still attendant on desert? Is this, we live on, heaven and the final state, or earth, which means probation to the end? Why claim escape from man's predestined lot of being beaten and baffled? God's decree, in which I, bowing bruised head, acquiesce. I have attained to my full fifty years, about the average of us all, tis said, though it seems longer to the unlucky man, lived through my share of life. Let all end here, me and the house, and grief and shame at once. Goodbye. My brothers are priests, and childless so. That's well. And, Thank God most for this, no child leave I, none after me to bear till his heart break the being of Franceschini and my son. And then the letter tells him that he has just that to bear, and he says he rose up like fire, and, fire-like, roared. This apparent air was a new disgrace, an ignominy he could not and would not bear. And he cries, Shall I let the filthy pest buzz, flap and sting, Busy at my vitals, and, nor hand nor foot lift, But let be, lie still, and rot, resigned? No, I appeal to God. What says himself, how lessens nature when I look to learn? Why, that I am alive, am still a man with brain and heart and tongue and right hand too, nay, even with friends, in such a cause as this, to right me if I fail to take my right. No more of law, a voice beyond the law enters my heart, quis est pro domino. Guido tells his judges that the serving people who knew his story agreed with him as to the course he ought to pursue, and that, Having selected four of them, he moved toward Rome and arrived there on Christmas Eve. For several days, influenced by the associations of the season, he delayed, but on the ninth day he felt that some end must be, and beckoned to his companions. Time is come. 
From here to the end of the speech we have the direct defence of Guido. It is a well-known proverb that he who pleads his own case has a fool for a client. This is not true in the case of Guido. His defence is shrewd and able. Every point is urged with skill and force. He is tactful and makes the most of every opportunity. He first shows that the killing of his wife and her parents was an act of passion which might not have been committed if he had met Pompilia at the door, or even Pietro, instead of Violante. And then, why, even then, I think, in the minute that confirmed my worst of fears, surely, I pray God that I think aright, had but Pompilia's self the tender thing who once was good and pure, was once my lamb and lay in my bosom, had the well-known shape fronted me in the doorway, stood there, faint, with the recent pang, perhaps, of giving birth to what might, though by miracle, seem my child. Nay more, I will say, had even the aged fool Pietro, the dotard, in whom folly and age wrought, more than enmity or malevolence, to practice and conspire against my peace, had either of these but opened, I had paused. But it was she, the hag, she that brought hell for a dowry with her to her husband's house, she, the mock mother, she that made the match and married me to perdition, spring and source of the fire inside me that boiled up from heart to brain and hailed the fury gave it birth. Violante Comparini, she it was, with the old grin amid the wrinkles yet, opened, as if in turning from the cross, with trust to keep the sight and save my soul, I had stumbled, first thing, on the serpent's head, coiled with a leer at foot of it. There was the end. Then was I wrapped away by the impulse, one immeasurable everlasting wave of a need to abolish that detested life. T'was done. You know the rest, and how the folds of the thing, twisting for help, involved the other two, more or less serpent-like. How I was mad, blind, stamped on all the earthworms with the asp, and ended so. Guido tries to make it evident that his act was that of a man careless of life. He claims that if he had thought of his own safety, he could have hired bravos to commit the murder or silently put his enemies out of the way by poison. So indifferent was he as to the result of his action that he took no pains to secure the warrant which would have given him the right to hire a conveyance to take him quickly to a place of safety. Clearly, my life was valueless. But since he has committed the deed, he is himself again. Health is returned, and sanity of soul. And he feels the instinct that bids him save his life. He appeals to his judges to vindicate his primal right to act as he did. He then bids them, take my whole life, not this last act, alone, and asks, what has society to charge me with? He is a count, and he has given his life to the service of the church. His last patron was a cardinal, whom he left unconvicted of a fault, and who, by way of gratitude, had aided him in the matter of the marriage. He had in vain asked the court to annul the marriage, but he has allowance for a husband's right. He has, it is true, been charged with exceeding that right. Such acts, he says, as I thought just, my wife called cruelty. She had carried her complaints to the archbishop and to the governor of Arezzo, and they, with full knowledge of the facts, confirmed authority in its wholesome exercise. Some say that their decision was influenced by friendship, hereditary alliance, prejudice for the name of a Franceschini, that could not be urged in this court. There are those who may say that the decision of his judges against him was caused by the popular clamour. He pleads also that he has only executed, in his deed, 
what the court had declared in a milder and less emphatic way representing and carrying out its essential thought the punishment of the court inflicted upon pompilia and caponsacchi shows that it deemed them guilty if they were not wholly guilty then the court had no right to punish them he calls the attention of his judges to the fact that the court in tuscany had condemned pompilia to imprisonment for life while the court in rome had inflicted only a nominal punishment upon caponsacchi for the breach of the priestly vow he asks the court then to absolve him the law's executant guido then gives the reasons why he should live first there is his mother whom he wishes to care for in her old age let her come break her heart upon my breast not on the blank stone of my nameless tomb then his brothers need help and he also wishes to lift up the youth and innocence of his son gaetano guido however does not make the slip which some interpreters say he does by admitting that gaetano is his son and thus implying pompilia's innocence and the inexcusableness of her murder he is too much on his guard for that he speaks of him as one whom law makes mine or as one who may be his by miraculous mercy at the close of his defence guido represents himself as a self-sacrificing defender of the social sanctities and when in times made better through your brave decision now might but utopia be rome rife with honest women and strong men manners reformed old habits back once more customs that recognize the standard worth the wholesome household rule in force again husbands once more god's representative wives like the typical spouse once more and priests no longer men of belial with no aim at leading silly women captive but of rising to such duties as yours now then will i set my son at my right hand and tell his father's story to this point adding the task seemed superhuman still i dared and did it trusting god and law they approved of me give praise to both and if for answer he shall stoop to kiss my hand and peradventure start thereat i engage to smile that was an accident in the necessary process just a trip of the torture irons in their search for truth hardly misfortune and no fault at all in considering the character of count guido we must remember that he is speaking at his own trial aware that every word he says is weighed by his judges he is anxious to appear at his very best what then does his speech tell us of himself he is evidently proud of his family which if not the oldest is admitted by all to be next to the oldest in tuscany he is deeply touched by the poverty into which it has fallen he suffers because of the exposures made of the little economies of his home how his mother makes the brocade strips of the seamy side of the wedding gown by raiment for a year how she dresses up the lamb's head with her own hands and how the wine used is three parts water he is tortured by the gossip of the town which reports that he beats his wife his whole soul rides at the thought of his marriage to pompilia who drew breath first mid rome's worst rankness through the deed of a drab and a rogue the imputation of dishonour to a member of his family his younger brother revolts his nature so that he cries must i burn my lips with the blister of a lie he also seems deeply religious and begins his speech in a most approved orthodox form in the name of the indivisible trinity all this may of course have been assumed and must not be taken too seriously his real character comes out when he attempts to extenuate his course of conduct he knows he is censured because he had bought a young girl by means of his title as if flesh and blood were aware he ought it is said 
to be ashamed of such an avowal. But Guido does not think so. What, he declares, is Franceschinihood worth if it cannot be bartered for something? Deny that titles have a market value, and no one would care to have them. Why should one work for fifty years to obtain a title if it could not serve to secure a girl's hand or a fool's purse? If titles had no value in the market, it would have been better for him to have spent his life as a dancer or a prizer, trades that pay. On the other hand, bid this buffoonery cease. Admit that honour is a privilege. The question follows, privilege worth what? Why, worth the market price, now up, now down. Just so with this, as with all other wear. Therefore, assay the market, sell your name, style and condition to who buys them best. People have often acted upon this theory, but it has seldom been set forth in such blunt and brutal fashion. Titles, no doubt, do have a money value, but Guido declares they have nothing more. He has no perception of the honour which is above all price, and he is incapable of seeing that while his position is a recognition of past services, it also entails an obligation to the performance of present duties. It is strange that a man, so proud of his family name, should be willing to degrade it into a ware to be sold to the highest bidder, because the moment titles become purchasable, they are no better than any other article in the market. But Guido is not content with the reduction of his title into a marketable commodity. He also reveals himself as a man to whom truth is not sacred. He has no sense of its intrinsic value. He is accused of gilding fact with fraud in the matter of the marriage. He had made himself richer than he really was. In reply, he virtually says, that that is of no consequence. He had carried out the essence of the bargain, had given what he said he would give, and what the other parties really wanted. What he said about his fortune was but a flourish round the figures of a sum, for fashion's sake, that deceives nobody. But it did deceive poor Pietro and Violante, and it was meant to deceive them. When Guido is charged by the court, with having written the letter attributed to her, he admits that he had caused her to trace the characters which he himself had first written, but he seeks to free himself from blame by the plea that he had induced her to do what she ought to have done. He was like the priest who makes the palsied finger cross the forehead at the critical time, or who answers for the babe at its baptism. In these cases, however, only good was meant to the persons for whom these things were done, while in his case what he assumed to do for Pompilia meant harm to her and to those whom she loved. Another example of Guido's disregard of the truth is disclosed in his account of the letters which he alleged had passed between Pompilia and Caponsacchi, and which, he declared, had been found in the room of the inn where they had been overtaken and apprehended. He notices the denial of their authorship, which had been made by them both, but he gives no proof to show that they did write them. He merely tells a story to illustrate his thought, that, of course, they must make a denial of some kind, and passes on to something else. The whole case rested upon the authorship of these letters, and if Guido had felt certain that his wife and the priest had written them, he would not have passed over them so lightly. If he knew they were forgeries, he had no right to use them. His treatment of them only shows more clearly that he never hesitated to subordinate the truth to his own purpose. Guido discloses himself as a man who was always conscious of his rights, but never of his duties. In all his discussion of marriage, he remembers the obligations imposed by it upon Pompilia but he altogether forgets his obligations to her. He complains that his wife violated her pact, that she did not act as a wife should, but he never once raises the question whether he had acted as, according to the vows made in marriage, he should have acted towards his wife. 
He illustrates his relation to Pompilia as that of an order to a monk. If he enters it and finds its way different from what he expected, if he had fancied Francis' manner meant roast quails, and so revolts against its regimen, he must not hope to have the order change its rules for his convenience, but rather expect punishment for his refusal to conform to them. But here Guido forgets one side of the matter, the right of the monk to demand that his order shall do what, in its rules, it promises to do. If the monastic institution violates his duty to the monk, it must expect to be called to account for it. All this Guido leaves out of his consideration. Then again, he treats Pompilia as if she were wholly free in her choice of a husband. If this were so, then she had no right to blame him for being what he was. It could be said to her, You knew him and chose to take him for a husband. Now Guido's friends say to him, The fact is, you are forty-five years old nor very comely, even for that age. Girls must have boys. And he replies, Why, let girls say so then. He utterly ignores the fact that his wife had no more choice in her marriage than the lamb has about being carried to the shambles. He is very clear as to what is due to himself. He expects from the bride loyalty and obedience, and he cries, with a wife I look to find all wifeliness, as when I buy, timber and twig, a tree, I buy the song of the nightingale inside. But he has not a word to say of what a wife had a right to look for in a husband. So it is throughout the whole defence of Count Guido Franceschini. Such is the art of Browning, that in spite of himself, he reveals what he essentially is. His defence is an unconscious accusation of himself. End of chapter 6「Section 7 of The Ring and the Book – An Interpretation – by Francis Bickford Hornbrook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 – Caponsacchi Giuseppe Maria Caponsacchi is the young priest in whose company Pompilia fled to Rome. He comes before the court in a state of great excitement and indignation. Here he is, he says, to tell the court the story, at the telling of which, only six months ago, the judges had smiled, as if to say, The sly one, all this we are bound to believe. Well, he can say no other than what he says. We have been young, too. Come, there's greater guilt. From this story he had received the jocular punishment of exile to Cirvita Vecchia, and now they come and tell him that Pompilia is dead, or dying, murdered by the husband from whom he had tried to save her. They had told him he need not meddle, law would care for her, and here is the result. The story that they had asked him to tell them seemed to fill the universe with sight and sound. But let him be, the hollow rock, condense the voice of the sea and wind, interpret you the mystery of this murder. The court had seen the beginning of this affair, and why should it be surprised at the end? He had himself foreseen it, and tried to prevent it, but had been rebuked, and, like an overzealous hound, kicked for his pains to his kennel. Now, he cries, the judges want his help and are ready to rehabilitate him, and recognise his true value. But Pompilia, the glory of life, the beauty of the world, the splendour of heaven, is fast dying. Kindness to him does not remit one deathbed pang to her. Nevertheless, he will help them, and even burn out his soul in showing them the truth. His part is done, but he will place Pompilia before them as she really was. He will restrain himself. Calmness will help her, and so he says, Calm I'll keep, as monk that croons, transcribing battle, earthquake, famine, plague, from parchment to his cloister's chronicle. 
He then gives an account of his family and his life experience up to the time when he first saw Pompilia. His family was old and noble, one of the greatest in the city of Arezzo. It had rendered great service in the past, and his great-uncle, who was a bishop, had saved the city from destruction and had been an example of humility and self-sacrifice. Caponsacchi had studied for the priesthood, with reason to expect advancement in the church, but when he came to take the vow, he felt himself too weak to keep it, and would have withdrawn. The bishop remonstrated with him, and showed him that there was an easier sense in which the vow was to be regarded, declaring that the church made, at present, quite other demands than in the days of the confessors and martyrs. St. Paul has had enough, and to spare, I trow, of ragged runaway Onesimus. He wants the right hand with the signet ring of King Agrippa, now, to shake and use. The church, he declared, had need of men of the world, with winning manners and poetic gifts. So, Caponsacchi says, he became a priest and performed the usual duties of his office with those of a man of the world. He heeded the advice of his bishop to pay his respects to certain ladies and to acquire a genteel manner, a polished presence, and tact. Then Caponsacchi gives an account of his first sight of Pompilia, as she appeared with her husband at the theatre, tall, beautiful, strange, and sad. She broke upon his vision like a picture of Raphael. As he stared at her, his friend, the canon Conti, cousin of Guido, tossed some comforts to her, making it appear as if Caponsacchi had thrown them. Conti promised to introduce Caponsacchi later, but the next day, at Mass, Conti informed him that Guido did not wish to know him, and advised him not to make Guido jealous, because, as it was, he beat Pompilia. Caponsacchi had better devote himself to light skirts or the great dame. Caponsacchi tried to take the advice, but became disgusted with both ladies, and resolved to attend faithfully to his priestly duties. His bishop, alarmed at his conduct, asked him if he were turning Molinist, to which Caponsacchi replied, What if I turned Christian? He then asked permission to go to Rome, where he could live alone and look into his heart a little. To all his friends he announced his intention of going to Rome. Caponsacchi then gives an account of the visits made to him by the woman messenger, who ostensibly came from Popilia, but who, he suspected, really came from Guido. The letter said, that she, to whom he had lately thrown the comforts in the theatre, had a warm heart, and loved him, and bade him visit her house on an evening when her husband would be away at his villa of Vittiano. To this Caponsacchi made reply, What made you marry your hideous husband? In this way he repaid Guido for his transparent trick. The next day another letter came from her, by the same messenger, reproaching him for his cruelty, and asking only for a fragment of his love. She had heard that he was going to Rome, and asked him to take her with him, because she was wretched in her home, and her husband was a monster. The letter also stated that he need not write, but that she was ever at the window of her room over the terrace at the Ave. To this he replied, I am a priest, and you are wedded wife, whatever kind of brute your husband proves. Here he has made Guido, the cheat and spy, anticipate Hell's worm once more. Still the letters continued to come, to which he returned always the same answer. At last one came, as from Pompilia, warning him that her husband suspected him, and begging him to stay away from the window. To this he replied that if it pleased him, he would pass the street that eve, since the street belonged to all. He determined to walk that way, in the hope that he might call Guido out of his hiding place, and say to him, What a man thinks of a thing like you? But as he passed the window, lo, there appeared Pompilia, with the great grave griefful air of Our Lady of All the Sorrows. She vanished, then reappeared, and addressed him. She reproached him for the letters which, she had been told, 
had come from him and which had been read to her but she was in sore need of help her parents had abandoned her her husband hated her and she must go to rome he had come upon her like a thief but even a thief had said the last kind word to christ and he too might render her the service she needed much now that she had looked into his eyes she knew he neither intended wrong nor wrote the letters and that he was true caponsacchi then promised to do the service she wished and recognized her at potency of truth but in the evening as he began to think it over and to realize all that his promise meant a new vision of life broke in upon him his heart urged him one way while the voice of his church urged him the other in the grey of dawn it was i found myself facing the pillared front of the pieve mine my church it seemed to say for the first time but am not i the bride the mystic love of the lamb who took thy plighted troth my priest to fold thy warm heart on my heart of stone and freeze thee nor unfasten any more this is a fleshly woman let the free bestow their life-blood thou art pulseless now leave that live passion come be dead with me perhaps he thought it was best for him to trust to god to help her without any interference on his part without any scandal on hers so he went about the usual duties of the church and then returned to his home but then the thought flashed across his mind that pompilia might think he had failed her just as the governor and archbishop had failed her because he feared she must not be allowed to think that of him and besides it was his duty as a priest to advise her seek help at the source above all not despair he went to her she reproached him and again appealed to him for aid he consented to give it and indicated the course she should pursue through the day he made all the arrangements and at midnight pompilia entered into the carriage and he addressed the coachman by san spirito to rome as if the road burned underneath reach rome then hold my head in pledge i pay the run and the risk to heart's content caponsacchi describes the journey the incidents by the way and the words that pompilia spoke each incident proves i maintain that action of the flight for the true thing it was for the first hour they were silent in the darkness like two martyrs somewhere in a tomb who wait the last day but so fearless and so safe in the morning caponsacchi told pompilia that they had passed perugia and were now opposite assisi and in answer to her question how long since they had left arezzo he said years and certain hours beside he related an incident which shows how anxious she was not to delay a moment on the way and he recalled a remark of hers that she was fearful now because her soul no longer knew pain then he remembers her inquiry as to how he had learned to serve women and whether men were not often as unhappy in their strength as women in their weakness at another time he says she wanted to know why he smiled at the great gate of some city and he told her not because she would understand but because she asked him again when they had heard the angelus she bade him read gabriel's song the lesson and the little prayer to raphael proper for us travellers at foligno he wished her to rest but she cried on to rome on on they travelled all that night and through it she moaned low and waved something away that seemed to menace her then i why in my whole life i have never prayed oh if the god that only can would help am i his priest with power to cast out fiends let god arise and all his enemies be scattered by morn there was peace no sigh out of the deep sleep when they were within twelve miles of rome and he rejoiced because their journey was so nearly over she seemed to dread the interruption and said i want no face nor voice that change 
and grow unkind. And he says, that I liked, that was the best thing she said. At another place where they stopped, he put Pompilia in the care of a woman with a child and asked her to comfort her. Pompilia thanked him for the good it had done her and said, This is a whole night's rest and how much more. Here, too, she asked him if he thought she had done amiss in making the effort to flee from Guido and called him friend. As they drove on from here, she wandered in her mind and addressed him as Gaetano, and he ordered the driver to stop no more, but to struggle through, then drench her in repose, though death's self pour the plenitude of quiet. At last, he continues, they reached Castelnuovo, in sight of Rome. He would have driven on, but Pompilia screamed out, No, I must not die. Take me no farther. I should die. Stay here. I have more life to save than mine. She swooned. We seemed safe. What was it foreboded so? Out of the coach into the inn I bore the motionless and breathless pure and pale Pompilia, bore her through a pitying group and laid her on a couch, still calm and cured by deep sleep of all woes at once. The host was urgent. Let her stay an hour or two. Leave her to us, all will be right by morn. Oh, my foreboding! But I could not choose. I paced the passage, kept watch all night long. I listened. Not one movement, not one sigh. Fear not, she sleeps so sound, they said. But I feared all the same, kept fearing more and more, found myself throb with fear from head to foot filled with a sense of such impending woe, that, at first pause of night, pretense of grey, I made my mind up it was morn. Reach Rome, lest hell reach her. A dozen miles to make, another long breath, and we emerge. I stood in the courtyard, roused the sleepy grooms. Have out the carriage and horse, give haste, take gold, said I, while they made ready in the doubtful morn. "'Twas the last minute. Knees must I ascend and break her sleep. I turned to go. And there faced me Count Guido. There posed the mean man as master. Took the field, encamped his rights, challenged the world. There leered new triumph. There scowled the old malice in a visage bad and black of the scamp. Count Guido made his charge against him, and while Caponsacchi was waiting, and still had the opportunity to gripe him by the throat and end his career, officers appeared on either hand and placed him under arrest. Then the room of Pompilia, where she was still sleeping, was entered. She awoke, she started up, and when she saw her husband, Away from between me and hell, she cried, Hell for me, no embracing any more, I am God's, I love God, God whose knees I clasp, whose utterly most just award I take, but bear no more love-making devils. Hence! She seized the sword of Guido, and would have slain him with it, had not the police interfered. She was held by them, and the room was searched. Then Caponsacchi demanded trial for himself and Pompilia before the Roman court. I demand that the church I serve decide between us, Write the slandered lady there. A Tuscan noble, I might claim the duke. A priest, I rather choose the church. Bid Rome cover the wrong with her inviolate shield. Caponsacchi reviews the different accusations made against him at the trial which followed, and the replies he had made. What of the letters of Pompilia to him? How was it that one who was innocent, and a stranger to him, could write such a page? She wrote it, he says, when the Holy Father wrote the bestiality that posts through Rome, put in his mouth by Pasquin. What about the answers to her letters? They are clumsy mimics of his own character, as likely to be Bembo's as his own. He wrote the prose in these letters, when St. John wrote the tract de tribus. How came the letters to be found in his room in the inn after his departure? 
because there were none to be found in his presence. What had he to say of the clandestine visits to the house of Guido? As well might it be said that he flew to the moon on a broomstick. A witness to these visits was a courtesan, and her testimony was worthless. What of the testimony of Borsi, the coachman, who said that during the flight there were kissings in the coach, frequent, frenetic? The coachman said that after several weeks of sharp imprisonment. This was the defence he had made on his trial, but the court appeared to have no faith in his innocence. He must, it thought, be a little in the wrong. He was human, but then Potiphar pressed him too hard to do anything much out of the way. Hence the jocular punishment about which his friends only laughed. He was sent to Civitavecchia. Now the murder had opened their eyes. So, after all, he had been a real St. George and Guido, a real dragon breathing flame. So, at last, they had seen the spirit of Guido manifesting itself, and discovered that he had forged the letters of which much had been made. As for himself, if he had been conscious of guilt, why then should he have fled from Arezzo? What need of flight? What were the gain therefrom but just damnation, failure or success? In the whole flight they had not stopped anywhere an hour, or diverged a step from the right road. The court, by its decision in Pompilia's case, had shown that it believed she had good cause for her flight. If the end was allowable, then why not the means used to that end? He is done with being judged. He knows himself guiltless in thought, word and deed. He will avow that he was blessed by the revelation of Pompilia, and bids them make the most of it. Then he pronounces an invective against Guido. But for Count Guido, you must counsel there. I bow my head, bend to the very dust, break myself up in shame of faultiness. I had him one whole moment, as I said, as I remember, as will never out of the thoughts of me, I had him in arm's reach there. As you stand, sir, now you cease to sit. I could have killed him ere he killed his wife, and did not. He went off, alive and well, and then effected this last feat through me. Me, not through you. Dismiss that fear. Twas you hindered me staying here to save her, not from leaving you and going back to him, and doing service in Arezzo. Come, instruct me in procedure. I conceive in all due self-abasement might I speak, how you will deal with Guido. Oh, not death, death, if it let her life be, otherwise not death. Your lights will teach you clearer. I certainly have an instinct of my own in the matter. Bear with me, and weigh its worth. Let us go away, leave Guido all alone, back on the world again that knows him now. I think he will be found... Indulge so far, not to die so much as slide out of life, pushed by the general horror and common hate, low, lower, left at the very ledge of things. I seem to see him catch convulsively, one by one, at all honest forms of life, at reason, order, decency, and use, to cramp him and get foothold by at least and still they disengage them from his clutch. What, you are he, then, had Pompilia once, and so forwent her? Take not up with us. And thus I see him slowly and surely, edged off all the table land, whence life upsprings, aspiring to be immortality, as the snake, hatched on hilltop by mischance, despite his wriggling, slips, slides, slitters down hillside, lies low and prostrate on the smooth level of the outer place, lapsed in the veil. So I lose Guido in the loneliness, silence and dusk, till at the doleful end of the horizontal line creations verge from what just is to absolute nothingness. Whom is it, straining onward still, he meets? What other man deep further in the fate, who turning at the prize of a footfall to flatter him and promise fellowship, discovers in the act 
a frightful face judas made monstrous by much solitude the two are at one now let them love their love that bites and claws like hate or hate their hate that mops and mows and makes as it were love there let them tear each other in devil's fun or fondle this the other while malice aches both teach both learn detestability kiss him the kiss iscariot pay that back that smatch of the slaver blistering on your lip by the better trick the insult he spared christ lure him the lure of the letters aretine lick him o'er slimy smooth with jelly filth or the verse and prose pollution in love's guise the cockatrice is with the basilisk there let them grapple denizens of the dark foes or friends but indissolubly bound in this one spot out of the ken of god or care of man for ever and ever more after this fiery utterance caponsacchi becomes conscious of being too deeply moved and that the court may have reason to be vexed or even to imagine he was in love with pompilia he cites an incident in their journey to show that this was not so and declares that she was not beautiful in any artistic sense she had he says the face of one who bore an invisible crown of martyr and saint or the face of one careful for a whole world of sin and pain he notes the fact that guido would not have vindicated his honour if he had escaped as he hoped to do for in that case no one would have known that he had killed pompilia he argues that the court only imputed a technical offence to him because of friends who think it may bring some difference to his defence he brings out the fact that pompilia sought him only when all others conti and guillichini had failed to respond to her appeal for help what had these gained by the refusal conti had been poisoned and guillichini sent to the galleys the courts of arezzo had convicted himself and pompilia for breaking in and stealing but the courts of rome could not so easily be deceived the lie which guido got arezzo to receive he did not dare to bring to rome caponsacchi says he chooses rome and above all the good augustinian monk who had heard pompilia's confession and declared he had never heard one so sweet and true and pure and beautiful he then seeks to calm himself with the reflection that he is as good as out of life and has only the duty of a priest who has had a deep experience of life to perform i do but play with an imagined life of who unfettered by a vow unblessed by the higher call since you will have it so leads it companioned by the woman there to live and see her learn and learn by her out of the low obscure and petty world or only see one purpose and one will evolve themselves in the world change wrong to right to have to do with nothing but the true the good the eternal and these not alone in the main current of the general life but small experiences of every day concerns of the particular hearth and home to learn not only by a comet's rush but a rose's birth not by the grandeur god but the comfort christ all this how far away mere delectation meet for a minute's dream just as a drudging student trims his lamp opens his plutarch puts him in the place of roman grecian draws the patched gown close dreams thus should i fight save or rule the world then smilingly contentedly awakes to the old solitary nothingness so i from such communion pass content o oh, great just good god miserable me the first impression made by the account of caponsacchi is that of its straightforwardness and reality it is evident that he has nothing to evade or conceal he opens his whole life for inspection he narrates in detail every incident of his relations with pompilia in the confident assurance 
that everyone will recognize them at their true worth, will discern that they are not coprolite, but parian. The first note of his character is sincerity. He never pretends to himself to be what he is not. It is clear that he did not enter the priesthood simply to earn a living or to get some advantage. The memory of a saintly great-uncle had inspired him to walk in his footsteps. He is conscientious in his studies and strives to make himself worthy of his high calling. He had, however, not realized all that priesthood involved, and so, when the vow is read to him, he stops short, awestruck, and cries out, How shall holiest flesh engage to keep such vow inviolate? How much less mine? I know myself too weak, unworthy. Choose a worthier, stronger man. He was one who did not wish to be a sham. He expected to keep his word when it had once been given. An insincere man would have felt no such compunctions. The brothers of Guido did not. Many would have promised without serious thought or with mental reservation. Caponsacchi's unwillingness to take the vow reveals him as a man who believed that words meant something and that promises were made to be kept. It is true that he consented to take the vow when it was interpreted in a larger and looser way, but the interpretation was not his own, but that of his superior in the church, and was, no doubt, generally accepted. In pursuing the course, which he afterward did as priest and man of the world, he was conscious of no violated promise. He was simply doing all that was expected of him. It is true that Caponsacchi did not show himself a spiritual hero. Such an one would have said, either the vow means something or nothing, and in either case I can have nothing to do with it. But he did, under the circumstances, show himself to be a man who would make no false pretenses, a man who was real and genuine. No doubt, the highest kind of man would not have allowed himself to be persuaded to pursue the course of conduct he did, but a man a little less sincere than he would have required no persuasion. Caponsacchi reveals courage. Farther on we shall see that he has moral courage, but here I speak only of that which is physical. No one can fail to see the indications of it throughout the poem. When he declined the invitation which Pompilia was supposed to have sent him, he said to himself, Last month I had, doubtless, chosen to play the dupe, accepted the mock invitation, kept the sham appointment, cudgel beneath cloak, prepared myself to pull the appointed self out of the window from his hiding place. Such had seemed once a jest permissible. Now I am not in the mood. Again, when another letter came beseeching him to stay away from the window of Guido's house, he replied, You raise my courage, or call up my curiosity, who am but man. Tell him he owns the palace, not the street. Again, when after his flight with Pompilia he was overtaken, Caponsacchi faced Guido and the rabble around him with an impassive front. Although appearances were against him, and all around were ready to believe Guido's malicious accusation, he never flinched for a moment, and, as a result, came off victorious. The only fear he shows is the fear that Pompilia may think he is a coward. At first, he hesitated to do as he had promised. He tried to make himself believe that God would aid her and work a miracle on her behalf. Then there came the thought that she might think, I fear the world now, fear the Archbishop, fear, perhaps, Count Guido. His real fear is that the reputation of Pompilia may suffer through his attempt to rescue her. Could he save her and not endanger that? Could she be rescued without a breath of scandal? So long as that seemed possible, he hesitated. When, at last, no other course was open, he acted like the man he was, unmindful of everything save the deliverance of the lady from the home, which to her had become a hell. Dr. Johnson said he loved a good hater. If he had lived long enough to read The Ring and the Book, and to study Caponsacchi, I think he would have found in him a man after his own heart. I know of no one in all literature 
who shows greater capacity for indignation. In that lower form of hate, which consists merely in personal ill will, others excel him. He was as good natured as Guido was evil natured. He took people pretty much as he found them, and evidently viewed them with large hearted tolerance. But there must have been in him, all the time, though hidden even from himself, a capacity for hating what was mean, a capacity without which a man can never be a power for righteousness. The source of real goodness in a man or woman lies in the intensity of his disposition to cleanse the face of the earth from all that smuts and besmirches it. This Caponsacchi had in full measure. It discloses itself in the taunting tone of his letters, in response to those which seemed to come from Pompilia, but which he felt sure came from Guido himself. Let the incarnate meanness cheat and spy, mean to the marrow of him, make his heart his food, anticipate hell's worm once more. It is evident in his regret that when he had had Guido within arm's length, he had not been more prompt. One quick spring, one great good satisfying gripe, and lo, there had he lain abolished with his lie, a spittle wiped off from the face of God. But no one who reads Caponsacchi's invective against Guido, one of the most tremendous utterances of concentrated contempt and hate in all literature, will need any other proof of his capacity for indignation. All other instances I have cited are mere mutterings of the storm which here breaks forth in cyclonic fury and, by its awful power, sweeps Guido before it. Out of the ken of God, or care of man, for ever and ever more. Such a soul has in itself something of the spirit of him who will overturn and overturn until righteousness is established in the earth. Combined with this disposition to hate the evil, we find what perhaps is the other and better side of the same feeling, a confident trust in the good, which no appearances to the contrary could destroy. He is a symbol of the completest faith of the human heart. The faith of Caponsacchi rested on no proof and was contradicted by all the available evidence. He had seen Pompilia only once, and that was enough. From that moment he recognised her at potency of truth. Then came the letters that, if accepted as Pompilia's, would make her vile, but his faith was not lessened by them. It enabled him to see through the mean devices of Guido, and he did not doubt her purity for a moment. As well might one tell him that a serpent had proceeded from the mouth of Raphael's Madonna, as to tell him that these letters came from her. When he saw Pompilia in the window, even as the lying letter said she would be found at such an hour, his faith rose superior to his sight, and he says, I thought, just so. It was herself. They have set her there to watch, stationed to see some wedding band go by, on fair pretense that she must bless the bride, or wait some funeral with friends wind past, and crave peace for the corpse that claims its due. She never dreams they used her for a snare, and now withdraw the bait has served its turn. Then we see the kindly, helpful spirit of the man. He thinks of himself as one who has a score of strengths with no use for them, and then of Pompilia, who has none. Only a kind heart would reason so. These are some of the qualities of the man at the time when Pompilia appealed to him for help. He was not the man he afterward became through her influence, but he must have had the possibilities of his later manhood in him. These might never have awakened, as they did, into fullness of life and power, but for his experience with her, but unless they had already been there, she would have availed no more for him than for others. It is not enough that the sunlight falls upon the earth. The earth must have the germs of life and beauty in its bosom. It was the glory of Caponsacchi that there was that within him which made him quick to discern the revelation in Pompilia's life and words. He assures us that he was blessed by the revelation. The first sight of her lifted him above his care for common and trivial things. He saw light skirts in her real ugliness and discerned the spiteful spirit 
of the great dame the bishop's table with its fine food and jovial conversation no longer attracted him he found it now more amusing to go pace at eve in the duomo watch the day's last gleam outside turn as into a skirt of god's own robe those lancet windows jewelled miracle the old life faded away in the light of the new vision to which he was not disobedient the service which pompilia asked him to render was one that called for the sacrifice of reputation he was a priest and if he hoped for promotion as no doubt he did there must be no spot on his name he might well ask whether he owed so costly a service to her why should he intervene when his superiors had refused to do so nobody could reproach him for declining to help her for to do what she besought him would subject him to suspicion if not condemnation of the good and to the incredulous laughter of fools happiness and prosperity lay in the prescribed and usual course the loss of all that was most precious to him was imminent if he took the unaccustomed and unusual way no wonder that all through the spring night he realized that he was passing from an old to a new form of life he was learning that he could bear blame more easily than blameworthiness that there is something better in this world than happiness that to do his duty however hard it might be for one however humble is the surest way to the highest life in some way he had always thought so but now he knew in his own experience that the very immolation made the bliss this knowledge endowed him with that rarest of all courage the courage to sacrifice reputation to character to surrender the approval of man for the consciousness of right he would rather be than appear to be right in taking up the cause of pompilia caponsacchi found also that he had been freed from bondage to the conventional he was a priest consecrated to the service of his church how dared he attempt any other service the new mission seemed one which he had no right to undertake the inward struggle must have been hard and long the church seemed to stand in the way of the service which his heart bade him render what he owed to the ecclesiastical institution conflicted with what he owed to the instinct of humanity should the pleading of a woman for deliverance mean more to him than the commands of the church to which he had sworn allegiance the church's call was divine that of the woman was humbly human the questionings of his heart drove him beyond the forms and shadows of things to their core and substance they compelled him to ask whether the church meant as much as it professed he recalled that it had not stood in the way of his careless and indifferent action it had allowed him to go on as he would until some living duty straight from the heart of things had appealed to him and then it had begun to whine about his duty to it why should it have no word to say until some real work was demanded of him and then all at once became urgent it had been silent when he lived as a fribbler and coxcomb had found voice to utter a denial only when he was moved to render a human service as between the two he preferred to obey the voice of god which made itself heard in a woman's cry for help rather than the scruples of the church which addressed him only in stereotyped phrases so caponsacchi was able to divine the real obligation he was under the instinct of his nature was wiser than the formal codes of the church because he was true he acted truly experience had taught him that the church was an echo rather than a voice often the two might and did sound the same note but now that the two were not in accord it remained for him to find his freedom in responding to the real call of god he learned that while there is a visible church that well serves to remind the world of the sanctities of the past there is also a still small voice which stirs the heart to serve the necessities of the present he found deliverance from the conventional in his recognition of the actual he made the discovery which it is well for all of us to make that conscience in so far as it means obedience to the ordinary and usual must be ignored even disobeyed if we would attain to the highest form of manhood or womanhood. 
It is evident, too, that in his experience, Kaponsaki had learned that the great deeds of the world are as possible in the present as in the past. He, and those before whom he had been tried, thought a heroic duty was done by those who in former ages had rescued forlorn damsels in some crisis of their lives. Such service was called chivalrous, even sacred, and it was deemed worthy of all honour. When St. George rescued the princess from the dragon, it was thought that he had well earned the title of saint. But here and now was a simple priest, who had endangered what must have been dearer than life itself, to rescue a girl in Arezzo, whom her reputed parents had abandoned, and whom her husband hated, from cruelty and shame. Was this so very different from the deeds of the ancient heroes and saints? Kaponsaki had learned to see that his deed was of the same piece with all the heroism and helpfulness of the past. Pompilia was as good as any princess, better than most of them. Her husband, Guido, was worse than the dragon whom St. George overthrew, and his attempt to save her was no less worthy praise. Caponsacchi no longer saw his deed in its littleness, because it was done by himself in Arezzo, for one so humble, but in its greatness, as a part of the manifestation of the love of God in human souls, in all places, in all ages, and for all who need. As he stands before his judges, he reveals his full consciousness of his right to place himself by the side of those who in past times had succoured the forlorn and helpless. Yes, I rise in your esteem, sagacious sirs, stand up a renderer of reasons, not the officious priest would personate St. George for a mock princess in undragoned days. What? The blood startles you? What, after all, the priest who needs must carry sword on thigh may find imperative use for it? Then there was a princess, was a dragon belching flame, and should have been a St. George also? End of chapter 7「Section 8 of The Ring and the Book – An Interpretation – by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 – Pompilia Pompilia, who now speaks, appears in a very different light from the others to whose voices we have been listening. She is not defending herself against a charge of crime, like Guido, nor is she a friend of the court, like Caponsacchi. She is a dying girl who sighs out her pitiful story, not so much to vindicate herself, for she feels no need of that, as to place the man, who had risked all to save her, in the right light. The keynote of her narrative lies in these lines. Then I must lay my babe away with God, nor think of him again, for gratitude. Yes, my last breath shall wholly spend itself in one attempt more to disperse the stain, the mist from other breath fond mouths have made about a lustrous and pellucid soul, so that, when I am gone, but sorrow stays, and people need assurance in their doubt, if God yet have a servant, man a friend, the weak a saviour, and the vile a foe, let him be present by the name invoked Giuseppe Maria Caponsacchi. In her narrative there are no literary or historic allusions. Guido and Caponsacchi were men acquainted with the world, its literature and art, and they reveal this knowledge in what they say, but there is nothing in Pompilia's story which indicates anything beyond the particular happenings of her own experience. She tells us about her church, San Lorenzo, and his curate, Otto Boni, of her play with her friend, of the goat that was made to stand on four sticks, of the madman who seized her hand and proclaimed himself to be Pope. She has no knowledge of the places through which she passed on her journey from Arezzo to Rome, or of the historic associations and memories of either city. Once she mentions the name of a famous physician, but only because he had visited her 
and given her some medicine which cured her childish ailment. Once she refers to the Molinists, but the word is put into her mouth by the Archbishop, to whom she has gone for deliverance from her trouble. He says to her, For, see, if motherhood be qualified impure, I catch you making God command Eve sin. A blasphemy so like these Molinists, I must suspect you dip into their books. When we remember that Pompilia could not read, we realise what a woodenhead the Archbishop must have been. Then the narrative has not the order and method, which we find in that of either Guido or Caponsacchi. It is the simple outpouring of a soul, to the loving hearts of the nuns, of her life experience, controlled by no other motive than the desire to write her friend. Her discourse cannot be analysed. I shall, therefore, attempt only to indicate its general course and spirit. Pompilia begins with the most simple facts of her life, and tells us her age, the name of the church, San Lorenzo, in which she had been baptised and married, and her name in full, Francesca Camilla Vittoria Angela Pompilia Comparini. She has been the mother of a son, Gaetano, exactly two weeks. She rejoices in the fact that her babe has been baptised and is safe from being hurt, and she hopes that when he becomes a man and asks what his mother was like, someone will assure him that she was not like the girls of seventeen whom he will ordinarily see. Her name, she hopes, will keep her apart in his mind from what girls are. Her son, she knows, will have no knowledge of his parents, nor will there be any one to care for him. For that reason she has given him the name of Gaetano, that he may have the help of a new saint, after whom only a few, as yet, are named. She does not want him to know her sad story. Everything in her experience has been a surprise. Pietro and Violante had declared that they were not her parents. She had always supposed that husbands loved their wives, but Guido hated her. Then people persisted in saying that Caponsacchi was her lover. Her whole former life seemed something apart from herself, unreal and fantastic. She recalls the incidents of a few days before, when, with her foster parents, she sat by the fire and talked of the boy who had been given her and what he would do when he was grown up. She tells how Pietro went out, and then came back to speak of the sights he had seen, and how, while he talked, and all were happy, the end came. She does not think that Pietro deserved punishment, and as for Violante, she had done wrong, but what she had done seemed right to her, and it was meant for the best. She had tried, too, to make all right by the marriage, although it was such a grief to give up one whom love had made her own. Perhaps, on the whole, it had been well. At any rate, now that she was dying, everything seemed softened and bettered. As she leaves life, all the past fades away into calm. She had lived happily with her parents until the time of her marriage, about which at the time she understood nothing, and was bidden by her mother to be silent. She relates how, on a rainy day, she was taken by her mother to San Lorenzo and married there in the empty church, and how afterward life went on just the same, until she became the witness of the quarrel between Pietro and Guido, and realised that something, low, mean, and underhand, had taken place. Violante, at last, consoled her with a promise of the high position she would occupy in Arezzo, as the wife of a nobleman, and the statement that they were to be all together there. Her memory of the four years she lived with her husband was almost a blank. During that time she was sustained by her prayer to God and her hope that, in answer to that prayer, someone would come to rescue her in her great need. She has really very little to forgive. Her husband had some right to feel aggrieved because no money came, as he had expected with the marriage. Then it was hard for him to learn that she was not the child of Pietro and Violante, and in his anger at them he revenged himself on her. 
she might have known what to do if she had been able to understand what he really wanted. But his plan was so different from anything she could imagine that all she tried to do to please him only angered him the more. Aware, as she was, that there was no communion of soul between herself and Guido, she thought she ought not to live with him as his wife. But the archbishop, whom she consulted, told her that she was to blame for thinking thus, and that her proposed course reflected discredit on Eve. Nor did he heed her complaint against the canon, Girolamo, Guido's younger brother. He bade her go back to her husband, and by her conduct towards him send the brother back to book again. But although she obeyed the advice given her, she did not lessen Guido's hatred of her or his brother's advances. She says, Henceforth I asked God counsel, not mankind. When she saved herself by her flight with the priest, people had said she showed herself the daughter of her shameless mother. This criticism made her feel that somehow her mother had been greatly wronged, and that she might have parted from her, the child she loved, because she wanted to save her from the fate which had befallen herself. But now, with the coming of her own child, she knew that God would care for him. People, Pompilia says, speak of her relations with Caponsacchi as though he were blameworthy, and the thought of writing him, that others may see him, as she sees him, purity in quintessence, gives her strength. She relates how she came to know him. She had seen him at the theatre, whither she had gone with her husband. As she was seated there, a twist of comforts was thrown into her lap. They seemed to come from Caponsacchi, but, as she regarded him, she felt sure he had not thrown them. Soon after, her cousin Conti came to her box and acknowledged as much. Guido, however, chose to believe that they came from Caponsacchi, and that he was her lover. He called her a wanton, drew his sword, and feigned a thrust. She was so accustomed to this that she did not heed it, but repeated the mere truth, and held her tongue. Guido declared that her amour with Caponsacchi was town talk, and that he would kill him the next time he found him underneath his eaves. Pompilia gives an account of the letters brought to her by the serving woman, who said they came from Caponsacchi, and explains how this maid, Margarita, tried to induce her to accept the proposals which, she said, were made in them. To all her suggestions, however, Pompilia was deaf until she bade her invite him to appear at her window that evening, and here she gives the motive which led her to do so. She had gone to bed one night, thinking, how good to sleep, and so get nearer death, when, what, first thing at daybreak, pierced the sleep with a summons to me? Up I sprang, alive, light in me, light without me, everywhere, change. I stepped forth, stood on the terrace, all the roofs, such sky. My heart sang, I too am to go away, I, too, have something I must care about. Carry away with me to Rome, to Rome. I have my purpose, and my motive, too, my march to Rome, like any bird or fly. Had I been dead? How right to be alive! Last night I almost prayed for leave to die, wished Guido all his pleasure with the sword, or the poison. Poison, sword, was but a trick harmless. May God forgive him the poor jest. My life is charmed, will last till I reach Rome. Yesterday, but for the sin. Ah, nameless be the deed I could have dared against myself. Now, see if I will touch an unripe fruit, and risk the health I want to have and use. Not to live, now, would be the wickedness, for life means to make haste and go to Rome, and leave Arezzo, leave all woes at once. Before this, she had gone to the governor, the archbishop, the holy friar, to Guillichini, and to Conti. She had besought them to help her, and all had declined to do so. 
but Conti refers her to Caponsacchi, your true St. George. As a last resort, she turned now to him and bade the serving woman, to her great surprise, tell him to come. Somehow Pompilia felt sure of his coming. She cried, He will come, and all day I sent prayer like incense up to God the strong, God the beneficent, God ever mindful in all strife and strait, who, for our own good, makes the need extreme, till at the last he puts forth might and saves. An old rhyme came into my head, and rang of how a virgin, for the faith of God, hid herself from the panims that pursued in a cave's heart, until a thunderstone, wrapped in a flame, revealed the couch and prey, and they laughed, thanks to lightning, ours at last. And she cried, Wrath of God, assert his love, servant of God, thou, fire, befriend his child. And lo, the fire she grasped at, fixed its flash, lay in her hand a calm, cold, dreadful sword, she brandished till pursuers strewed the ground. So did the souls within them die away, as o'er the prostrate bodies, sordid, safe, she walked forth to the solitudes and Christ. So should I grasp the lightning and be saved. When, at her bidding, Caponsacchi arrived, she appealed to him to take her with him to Rome, to her own people, and so to save something that's truly a me than this myself. His answer was, I am yours. After some delay the preparations were made for the flight, and at the dawn of day they fled together. All that he had been to her, and had done for her on the journey, was a revelation of all that was good. Perhaps he was not one of the great saints, but he had done something of a saint's service for her, and so she cries, This one heart brought me all the spring. She relates all the kindly services he rendered, how, at one place, he told her all about a brave man dead, and how, at another town which seemed as if it would turn Arezzo's self, he put a newborn babe into her arms. I could believe himself, by his strong will, had woven around me what I thought the world we went along in, every circumstance, towns, flowers and faces, all things helped so well. For, through the journey, was it natural such comfort should arise from first to last? As I look back, all is one milky way. Still bettered more, the more remembered, so do new stars bud while I but search for old, and fill all gaps i the glory, and grow him. Him I now see make the shine everywhere. So it was, until the dread morning, when her husband and the world broke in upon her slumber at the inn, and she saw her angel helplessly held back, while Guido towered triumphant. Then came all the strength back in a sudden swell. I did for once see right, do right, give tongue the adequate protest. For a worm must turn if it would have its wrong observed by God. I did spring up, attempt to thrust aside that ice block twixt the sun and me, lay low the neutraliser of all good and truth. She had borne the wrongs inflicted on herself and her parents, and the possible harm to her unborn child, but she could not bear to have her angel self made foul in the face by the fiend that struck there. That was the reason why her first and last resistance was invincible. Then she learned that prayers move God, threats and nothing else move men. She will not have the service fail. Her angel saved her. The judges had done right, when they consigned her to the care of the nuns, who said and sung away the ugly past. Through his service, her babe had been born in quiet of her parents' home. It would not have peeped forth, the bird-like thing, through that Arezzo noise and trouble. Back had it returned, nor ever let me see. But the sweet peace cured all, and let me live and give my bird the life among the leaves God meant him. Yes, through what he had done, she had been given the opportunity to think over her past, 
and to allow good premonitions come to her unthwarted. Her child had been born, all in love, with naught to spoil the bliss. Now, as never before, she realised the meaning of God's birth, and how he grew like God in being born. As for her foster parents, all is over, they see God. For her husband she gives him, for his good, the life he takes, and she prays that he may touch God's shadow and be healed. He has rendered her a service in destroying a bond which was hateful to them both. As for her child, he will be the safer without father and mother, through God who knows I am not by. She is ready to compose herself for God, recalling, as her last words, all that she owes to Caponsacchi, her soldier saint, and she closes with the words, My fate will have been hard for even him to bear. Let it confirm him in the trust of God, showing how holily he dared the deed. And, for the rest, say, from the deed, no touch of harm came, but all good, all happiness, not one faint fleck of failure. Say, I am all in flowers from head to foot. Say, not one flower of all he said and did might seem to flit unnoticed, fade unknown, but dropped a seed, has grown a balsam tree whereof the blossoming perfumes the place at this supreme of moments. Pompilia remembers that Caponsacchi is a priest and cannot marry. She thinks he would not marry if he could. Marriage on earth seems such a counterfeit, mere imitation of the inimitable. In heaven we have the real and true and sure. Tis there they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels. Right. Oh, how right that is! How like Jesus Christ to say that! Be as the angels, rather, who, apart, know themselves into one, are found at length married, but marry never, no, nor give in marriage. They are man and wife at once, when the true time is. Here we have to wait, not so long neither. Could we, by a wish, have what we will, and get the future now, would we wish aught done, undone in the past? So let him wait God's instant, men call years. Meantime, hold hard by truth and his great soul. Do out the duty. Through such souls alone, God, stooping, shows sufficient of his light for us in the dark to rise by. And I rise. In Pompilia we have a revelation of one whose pure beauty redeems the world in which she moved from universal blame. Without her in the poem, as without such souls in life, we should lose our hope in humankind. We need her perfect whiteness to hearten us, as she heartens the Pope with the assurance that the world, in the absolutist drench of dark, ne'er wants a witness some stray beauty beam to the despair of hell. She is different, in all respects, from the other characters who reveal themselves in the poem. Guido and Caponsacchi are men acquainted with life. They have had some experience in affairs. Guido has been connected with the pontifical court for thirty years. He knows the men of position and power. Caponsacchi is the polished man of the world, and he occupies a dignified and influential place in the city of Arezzo. Through their speeches we are continually finding references to famous works of art, to the classic books of the nation, to the theologians of the church, and to the prevailing theological thought of the time. But Pompilia is only the girl wife, only seventeen, and her portraiture is in perfect keeping with everything we know of her age, rank, and experience of life. She says nothing that contradicts these. Her speech in the poem does not contain a single literary allusion. There is not the slightest indication of any acquaintance with historic events, hardly a word that shows a knowledge of anything beyond her home and the happenings in the immediate neighbourhood. She knows the way from the house of her father and mother to the church of San Lorenzo in Rome, and she speaks of her parents, the priest of the parish church, the marble lion rushing from the wall, the goat 
that the man made to stand on four sticks, the madman who claimed to be Pope, the poor image of the Virgin, thin white glazed clay in the niche, the game she played with her little friend. That is all she knows of Rome, and she knows no more of Arezzo, her husband's palace, the church, the theatre, and the houses of archbishop and governor, and the few streets that lead from one to the other are all that she tells us of a city, rich in memories of men famous in literature and art, in state and church. The great world of eminent men and memorable deeds was to her unknown. Reading might have widened her world, but Pompilia could not read, and all she says is limited by her experience of life. Once she refers to a famous physician, but she remembers him as the thin, austere man who gave her the bitter dose that cured her childish ailment, so ugly all the same. She mentions the Molinists, who were exciting attention in the religious world in her time, only because she happens to recall what the Archbishop said to her when she appealed to him for relief. Pompilia, too, knows nothing of the places through which she journeys from Arezzo to Rome. Caponsacchi gives a description of every step of the way, the name and character of each place, the time when they arrived and when they left. His is the narrative of an educated man, but Pompilia's story reveals her utter ignorance of places and times. If we knew about her in no other way, we could yet easily see, from her account of the journey, that things outside herself made little or no impression upon her. There are only two distinct points in her mind. The home of her husband in Arezzo, and the home of her reputed parents in Rome. Her only concern was to escape from the one, to find refuge in the other. She recalls, with a vivid sense of gratitude, all that Caponsacchi did for her, and was to her on the way. She knows that, this one heart brought me all the spring. But of the journey, all she can tell is, each place must have a name, though I forget. How strange it was! There, where the plain begins, and the small river mitigates its flow. An ignorant girl could not better describe her ignorance. There are many indications of the artlessness and simplicity of Pompilia. The splendour of art does not impress her. Her child was born outside the walls, and so had to be baptised at St. Paul's, the nearest church, of which she chirps, A pretty church, I say no word against, yet stranger-like, while this Lorenzo seems my own particular place, I always say. St. Paul's is one of the most beautiful churches in Christendom, but to Pompilia it is a pretty church. Art is of no consequence to her, compared with San Lorenzo, the church in which she felt at home. She amuses herself, just as a child might, even in the presence of death, with a recitation of her names, Francesca, Camilla, Vittoria, Angela, Pompilia, Comparini. She calls her son Gaetano, because the saint, after whom he was named, was a recent one, and had not grown weary like her own five saints, and so might take better care of him. Her faith is so simple, natural, and spontaneous, that she can weave amusing fancies around it, and still reverence it, not less, but all the more. Pompilia makes no defence, and utters no denial. She is too conscious of her innocence to feel the need of asserting it, and she needs no defence. The simple unfolding of her life experience is enough. Others may plead and reason. She only tells what she knows. As one listens to her, he finds it impossible to suspect her of any wrong. All that she says has the ring of truth in it. Her purpose in speaking is to vindicate the character of Caponsacchi, who had risked all to save her. She wants him to know that his service has not failed, and that through him God has enabled her to rise into a higher and better life. In all she says, she reveals a soul that was animated by concern for others. We might easily suppose that the experience of Pompilia would render her harsh and uncharitable in her judgments of her little world. Who could blame her if it had? Almost everybody had failed her, 
and had been unfaithful to trust, as far as she was concerned. Her own mother had sold her before she was born. Her foster parents, whom she had been brought up to believe were her real parents, had publicly disowned her. Her husband had disregarded all the sanctities and even the decencies of the marriage relation, making her life a protracted martyrdom and ending with the murder. But, in spite of all these things, her judgments are kindly and manifest the love that never fails. She finds some justification for every one, some motive at the heart of each, which may lessen the blame attaching to each act. While she keenly realises all the wrong that others have done her, and knows how bad it was, she has a perception which enables her to understand the impulse of good in the blameworthy deed. She says that Violante did wrong in buying her from her poor mother and passing her off as her own child to her husband. But then, she thinks, she meant well by it. Her own childhood was happier and better than it would otherwise have been, and old Pietro's days were fuller of sunshine because of the presence of a child in his home. Then Violante did not think she had really told a lie. She thought, moreover, real lies were lies told for harm's sake, whereas this had good at heart. Then, she thought, Violante had meant to atone for her fault by giving her in marriage, in which everything would be righted. To do this she had sacrificed the dearest affection of her heart. And so Pompilia declares, I know she meant all good to me, all pain to herself, since how could it be aught but pain to give me up, so from her very breast? She meant well. Has it been so ill in the main? Pompilia's judgment of her poor unknown mother is equally tender and true. She imputes to her motives of which she, herself, is conscious. Might not she, terrible as the thought is, yield her Gaetano to save him, and so might not her mother have sold her to save her? If she sold, what they call sold, me, her child, I shall believe she hoped, in her poor heart, that I at least might try, be good and pure, begin to live untempted, not go doomed and done with, ere once found in fault, as she. Even the miserable serving woman, Margarita, who sought to tempt her to evil, is not utterly condemned. To her, she says, Let it suffice I either feel no wrong, or else forgive it. Yet you turn my foe, the others hunt me, a new throw a noose. She cannot find any goodness in Guido. For him she attempts no palliation, but she pardons him and gives him the life he takes. Perhaps, after all, he had rendered a service, though he meant it not, in her murder. He had thus ended a relation which was essentially false. Her presence had always been an annoyance to him. Therefore it will be well if they never meet again. Still, even in this soul, Pompilia believes there may be something to love. I could not love him, but his mother did. Even for him, she thinks the presence of God may avail, and she prays that it may. But where will God be absent? In his face is light, but in his shadow healing too. Let Guido touch the shadow and be healed. Pompilia's insight grows and deepens, so that at last she trusts in it more than in any merely external authority. She is a devout Catholic, and, to her mind, an archbishop stands for God. When she had gone to him, and had poured out her troubles, as she would to her mother, he gave advice, and she received it humbly. But she learns through her experience that he was mistaken, and cries, But I did wrong, and he gave wrong advice, though he were thrice archbishop. That I know. She divines that the instinct of her heart is wiser than any official authority. It would be foolish to say that this young and ignorant girl revolted against ecclesiastical authority. She could never have dreamed of such a thing. She had only learned that there were some things she knew for herself better than anyone in the world. In these she was taught of God. Pompilia shows that she had the gift which enables one to divine the natures of men so that she trusted rightly, 
even against all appearances. The comforts of the theatre seemed to have been thrown by Caponsacchi, but Pompilia knew better. Ere I could reason out why, I felt sure, whoever flung them, his was not the hand. A web of lies is woven about him. She hears letters read, purporting to come from him, which must have made him odious to the soul of a pure woman. But in spite of them, she feels sure that he is true, and will render her true service. She knew him by the crystalline soul. Her experience has taught her to see through shams. The way in which the governor threatened her foster parents with punishment for theft, though they had only received from her what they had given her, and the indifference with which she had heard her complaints, taught her how little impartial justice there may be in the administration of affairs. To her it became clear that the forms of justice were often mere travesties of the vision of ideal right that is revealed to the pure in heart. Nothing is more beautiful in the character of Pompilia than her conviction of the dignity and responsibility of motherhood. It was that which prompted her flight from the home of her husband. While she had no one to care for but herself, she was resigned to suffering and death. After all, what did it matter? Deserted by her parents, hated by her husband, persecuted by those about her, her appeal for comfort and help disregarded by church and state, a lonely girl in a strange city, it could make no difference how soon or in what way the end came. That was her only way out of trouble into peace at the last. But when the sense of a life, more than her own, dawned upon her, she saw a new duty and loyally responded to it. She called for aid and determined to flee. She accepted the obligation to defend that trust of trusts, life from the ever-living. This sense of motherhood revealed to her something of the way in which God cares for his children. God will care for the little one whom she is leaving better even than her mother heart could wish. He shall have in orphanage his own way all the clearlier. If my babe outlived the hour, and he has lived two weeks, it is through God who knows I am not by. So all the significance of the Christmas time and the mystery of the Incarnation grew clear to the mother heart. Now she felt what she had always believed. She discerned, in her own life, what the theologians reason about, and often, by their reasonings, obscure. She and Mary were alike mothers. I never realised God's birth before, how he grew likest God in being born. This time I felt like Mary, had my babe lying a little on my breast like hers. Such is the character revealed in the story of this ignorant Italian girl of only seventeen. She had, in her own way, learned the deepest wisdom of life. The source of all her thought and action was love for others. She saw the evil of the men and women about her, but she saw more clearly the good in the evil. The hardest experiences of hatred, indifference and neglect only imbued her with tender pity and a spirit of forgiveness. By her fidelity to each duty of life, as child, wife and mother, she acquired that insight which pierced to the core of things and infallibly distinguished between the true and the false, the real and the apparent. Through her brief experience of motherhood, she realised the sweetest and noblest ideals of the Christian faith. End of chapter 8